screen. Give me, you're probably seeing like my whole screen here. Give me one second to get the, let's get the full screen going on this. Whoop, spoilers. Okay. Great. Is everyone seeing that okay? Yep. Yes. Yeah. All right. So thanks so much. I really appreciate you all coming to hear me talk at the end of, you know, approaching the end of semester or quarter, whatever it is for you. I know it's a tough time. Um, it's a little bit of a different time than you usually are here. So much appreciated for the accommodations. I'm excited to talk to you today, even though what I'm talking about is not mathematical biology per se, as Thomas said in his nice introduction, uh, my, my training, my, my heart is in mathematical biology. I think you'll see a lot of the, a lot of the techniques and the spirit of the work um, really resonates with the things that we do in math biology too. And so I, I'm going to talk to you today about this is not only recent, this is very recent work. This is like un, unpublished work. This is in preparation. So very, um, very fresh, very recent work that I have with a collaborator at UCLA, Phil Chadro. Uh, actually, he just recently accepted a job at Middlebury. So he'll be coming up to New England with y'all. Um, he's a postdoc until then. And then a um, thesis student here at Harvey Mudd, Solomon Buller Kaplan, has also uh, contributed to some of this work. So it's been like a really nice, nice work with some um, great junior co-authors. And OK, I got to get the all right, <laughs> there we go. So let me just give you the lay of the land of uh, the way that I think about this area when I'm working on it. So opinion dynamics on networks, there's a lot of different ways to study opinions and social networks. What I'm gonna talk about today is uh, really from kind of a theoretical mathematical perspective. And here's, here's the scene. The thing that we wanna study is to build simple mathematical models of the evolution of real valued opinions of agents. So when we think about opinions, there's different kinds of ways that we could quantify opinions. And the ones we're gonna think about today would be opinions that might lie on some kind of spectrum. So I'm gonna use X sub I to denote the opinion of node I, and this is gonna be time dependent, will, will evolve in time. So you could imagine, um, you can see I've got color coded from uh, orange to, to teal. This is gonna be taken on some interval of of the real line say. So we'll, for concreteness, we'll, we'll focus on negative one to one. And the interesting thing is going to be not the quantification of these opinions, but rather how they evolve um, and how they evolve in particular according to their interactions with other agents. And so this is where the networks piece of it comes in. And that's the schematic I have. So we're gonna think about each agent in our social system as a node in the network. So that's the circles. Uh, each interaction or relationship or connection that these agents have is encoded by an edge in this graph. Uh, those are the those are the lines, and then each of these nodes is uh, is endowed with is given one of these opinion states. So each node has uh, a state x of i that's associated with it. So we're going to keep the graph fixed. We will keep the relationship interaction. The possible interaction structure is fixed, but we will be evolving the states that the node take. So that's represented both by the numbers and the schematic and also the, the colors. So the only thing that kind of remains to talk about here with these models is how do these opinions evolve? We need some kind of update rule um, for how the interactions are gonna change the opinions. And so the most kind of broadest general thing that you could think about is that we might use some kind of differential equation uh, so something that looks like what you see on the bottom of the slide. Uh, we need to talk a little bit more about what are some particular like interesting choices of right hand side that we could use and study and try to understand a little bit more about this problem. But that's the big kind of um, quick and dirty idea of, <laughs> of this whole this whole field, the things that that I'm interested in studying. Um, and I want to motivate the particular model that I'm going to talk about today uh, with an old sociological experiment, which I am just delighted by. So this is, this is called the Ash experiment. And um, I love <laughs> I love this picture of the experimental setup because this really shows you this is um, this is taking place at Harvard in the 50s. And so um, what you see here is the the folks sitting around the table. Those are like 
Harvard students of the day. So this gives you really a really a picture of what Harvard looked like then, right? Um, and so these are students that are recruited to do these experiments. And here's the experimental setup. They're given um, what they're seeing is these two cards with the vertical lines. So they have the one on the left that just has one vertical line, and the one on the right, which has three. And their task is really simple. I think that uh, we could all do this pretty confidently. It's which uh, vertical line on the right card matches the one on the left. It's a very simple task. Um, so their job is, is to go through it and to determine this. And the trick is, the little catch here, is that of this, this set of uh, students who are being experimented on, actually only one of them is naive. The, all the others are, are actors they've been told ahead of time okay, on this particular card, we're gonna all say, everyone's gonna agree that three is the, is the correct choice, except for this one. <laughs> there's, there's one of these guys that doesn't know. And so the experiment then is to see how often, or does this, uh, this person who is, is naive, are they going to go along with the group and come to consensus? Or are they gonna you know, stick, to, stick to their, uh, their beliefs on this simple task? And, um, what they see, perhaps unsurprisingly, per the title of the slide, is that uh, a really like surprisingly large proportion of the time, our um, our naive experimentee goes along with the consensus, even though uh, he doesn't agree initially, um, and so he's sort of persuaded by these other these other agents whose whose opinions are actually fixed. Um, so this is there's many like such experiments like this that that uh, psychologists and sociologists are doing in the 50s and 60s is very popular topic of study and especially um, folks started thinking about trying to build models of things like committees trying to come to consensus on committees. And um, that's the that's actually the groundwork for where these models came from originally they're not they're not uh, really they didn't really start in the mathematical community they started in the sociology community. And so if you want to build a model of consensus like this, um, perhaps the simplest thing you could do, and this is a, this is a model due to Abelson, is to do uh, what I'm going to call repeated averaging. And so maybe if you haven't seen these before, the right hand side might look a little complicated, um, but it's not so bad. The little J tilde I just says, uh, if the agents have an interaction, if they're connected, uh, then what you're going to do is you're just going to sum over the, at each, uh, sort of time step at every time you're going to sum over the opinions of your neighbors um, and then the bottom is just a normalization so you're really just doing averaging right and this mathematically is something that is like extremely well understood right we we know we know what's going on here um, we we can expect that what's going to happen is we're all going to end up at uh, wherever sort of the uh, the harmonic solution is here the harmonic average um, which is what you see in the picture uh, so that was sort of the some of the initial models that these uh, these psychology folks were were proposing. Um, unfortunately, though, this model like dynamically, it's not so interesting, right? There's not really so much that it can do, um, and it doesn't capture a lot of like interesting phenomena that actually happen, for example, uh, on committee or small group meetings and things like this. So you might say, um, okay, how can we make this a little more interesting from a dynamics perspective? Um, and this is exactly what uh, this guy Taylor did. He said, well, we don't always see consensus. Sometimes we see uh, fractions. Sometimes we see fragmentation, um, even in those experiments, right? Uh, sometimes we would, we would see fragmentation. And so uh, his insight was, well, you could actually uh, move the state of this model away from consensus. You can break this repeated averaging model's behavior just by introducing zealot nodes. I see a hand, Jonathan. Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I have just a okay. question. So zero is like, I mean, the, in the in your previous case, in the average consensus, zero mm -hmm. is kind of not having an opinion. Can we think of it like that? With plus one and minus one, the two opinions. I would think about it perhaps as a moderate opinion so maybe a helpful like framework to think about is if we think about the like political ideologies in the united states uh maybe they're not purely one-dimensional but we could sort of simplify it that way and say 
maybe negative one is extremely liberal, the most liberal person, and positive one is the most conservative person. In that case, zero would be perhaps a moderate. So you're living somewhere in between, um, in between those two. Is that helpful? Yeah, that's helpful. But I mean, I would I would have thought that consensus would be that they choose. I mean, they agree on one opinion and then select it. But the consensus that you reach from here is more in the sense that they all lose a strong opinion and they just. That's right. So so mathematically, or what we're thinking about as consensus is not okay. We all agreed on you know one candidate and we're moving them forward. Um, in like a discrete opinions kind of way, but rather to say that all the nodes have the same opinion once this model is converged. So they all they all agree. And in this case of averaging, what's gonna happen, right, is that they're actually moved toward the center. So, if you uh, want so to in this sense, the... maybe it's not like politics, but. <laughs> if you wanted to have you... one opinion, I mean, if they had to decide more between my, minus one and one, you would add maybe a nonlinearity to your to the model. To Beautiful, me. exactly. So there are two ways to break this is either you could do what Taylor did um, and introduce zealot. So you introduce nodes uh, or agents in the system that don't change their opinions, or you introduce a nonlinearity, which is the next thing I want to talk about. <laughs> so exactly right. Um, but I want to talk about the zealots one because the model I'm going to talk about has both. It has the nonlinearity and the zealots. Um, so I, I kind of gave away already what I mean by zealots. So we can imagine these nodes that have these really dark borders. Um, these are the nodes that no matter what, they're not going to change their opinion. So they're they're stationary, or in the sense of like a like a physical system, we could think about them as an external forcing, essentially. And so if you do this, then okay, this is also something that's uh, a system that's that's pretty well understood mathematically. Um, we know what we're going to get is something that looks like kind of like a force balance, right? Uh, a nice harmonic solution on this graph. So this is one way to break consensus, but um, Jonathan exactly pointed out another way, which is which is that we could also introduce nonlinearities. And Taylor Taylor actually commented on this, I think, in his original work as well. Um, and one thing that would be sort of nice to be able to reproduce these models is the idea that what we often see is that people will come together in consensus with small groups or factions, but they don't have like a, a global consensus. Um, so you might see something that looks like maybe today we might call them echo chambers or something like this. And so a way like an interesting nonlinearity that you could build in for a dissensus uh, could be something that models uh, what the psychologist calls selective exposure. And so the idea there is that individuals do feel this pressure to move toward consensus that's real but really they're much more likely to adopt an opinion if it confirms or supports the biases they already have so if something is very very different uh from the opinion that they currently have they're not going to be pulled toward that opinion they're only going to try to form consensus with those that are sort of close to them this is the um the sociological principle and then there's a really nice simple nonlinearity. Uh, that was introduced by Hexelman and Krauss in uh, 2002. And this is uh, what now today is uh, perhaps the most commonly studied version of a bounded confidence model. And so what do we have here? Let's let's break it down a little bit. We have the opinion state as before. And you, I mean, the right hand side, it looks a little scary, but it's but it's not at all. So this, um, these models get their name from this parameter C, which is called the confidence bound that's gonna determine the interaction cutoff. So the idea is if two agents are uh, more than a distance C apart in opinion space on this real interval, then they're not going to interact. So what we have here with this bold one is just an indicator function. So this is gonna be a sharp cutoff. Um, and then if you're within that, that confidence bound distance, if you're receptive to each other, then you'll just do that repeated averaging model. Okay, so here's a here's a quick example. If we take the cutoff to be 0.5, then not all of these agents will interact, right? If I sort of gray out all of these interactions, um, well, let me actually be more precise. They may interact, but they're not receptive to each other. So each of these these uh, gray edges you see here, there will be no effect um, from the update rule. So this actually then sort of effectively changes our graph structure. But also in a time-dependent way, because at each stage, 
right? These agents may change their opinions due to averaging with the neighbors they are receptive to. And so then at each stage, you look and see um, which nodes you're receptive to and, and update. Okay, I'm showing an example that's discrete time and my, um, my equations are continuous time. So forgive me for that, but um, here's uh, just some examples of how a classical bounded confidence dynamics can look at, and as you can imagine, um, they depend, the way where your dynamics end up depends on a whole lot of things. It depends on the number of agents you have. It depends on the graph structure. It depends on the initial distribution of opinions. Um, and of course, it depends on the confidence bound. So I'm showing you two examples here on the same graph structure, same number of nodes. Um, but the top is a case where we can actually get consensus out of this model um, because the receptivity uh, threshold is relatively large and the opinions are, are sort of drawn from a uniform distribution. They're relatively close to each other. And then a case where we have fragmentation, we have the census. So we have some, some uh, agents coming together in consensus or not consensus, but a uh, small group consensus, some that are uh, effectively disconnected from the graph and, and maintain and, um, and so on. So we can get actually like amazing, there's amazing, like really rich dynamics in these bounded confidence models. Um, they're quite popular to study. So here you, the two extreme opinions are zero and one instead of minus one and one, correct? Oh, in this, in this, uh, yes, right. in this figure, that's right. That's right. Thank you for, <laughs> for noting that. Yeah, actually this figure was made by one of my, um, one of my research students last summer, Christina Catlett. Who is uh she was a wonderful, wonderful research student. And so um does it depend? I mean, do you have a so when c equals 0 0.6, for instance, mm -hmm. can you set up the initial conditions so that you have a census or do you have a single attractor? Ah, yeah. So that's a great question. So what you when you have 0 0.6, this is more than like half of the half of the space, right? So we could construct initial conditions as long as we didn't have if we if we have a small enough number of agents we could construct initial conditions that would come to dissensus right i could pick if i have two agents then it's it's uh that's sort of the easiest case right to pick um to pick two that are more than 0.6 i can do that but the more agents that you have um the harder and harder it becomes to get the census in the case where you have large receptivity. And I'm I'm sweeping some theoretical results about Hegselman Krauss under the rug here because it's not what I'm planning on talking about precise, I, precisely. But there are actually like more uh, precise like ways to talk about exactly when you expect to see consensus and not depending on these quantities. Yeah, this is a great question. Other questions so far? Great, yeah, thanks. So um, let me tell you what I've been working on with, with Solomon and with Phil. Um, we have been interested in uh, a question I would get a lot when I would talk about Hexelman Krauss type models or um, in papers when I when I study Hexelman Krauss models is well, what happens if you like smooth out this cut up, could you make this sort of a nonlinearity that is uh, is not the sharp cutoff, but rather maybe something a little bit a little bit more smooth. And so with Phil and Solomon, we've been working on developing such a model, um, which I'm going to present to you today. Um, it has two parameters and one of those parameters, which I'll call gamma, you can tune to um, to not only uh, it's not only something that looks sort of like bounded confidence. Um, I'm going to talk to you about ways in which it actually specifically for certain parameter choices of gamma recovers the repeated averaging the bounded confidence model um, and then has this whole like rich area of dynamics in between um, and we're, we're sort of interested in the transition between these two states and understanding the dynamics of this model and uh, it turns out that there's actually a really nice studying this particular model which has um, some nice nicer properties perhaps than the than the Hexelman Krauss model allows us to study interactions of stability of consensus states and community structure of the networks, which has been like a really nice, um, really nice result, really nice feature of these models. So here's, 
let's <laughs> just jump right into it. Here's the model. Sorry, Heather, oh, I'm just yes, going to interrupt for a second. I think there was a question about um, guest. Do you want to go ahead and? Oh, sorry. If it was in the chat, I didn't have the chat open. My apologies. Please go ahead. Well, I saw on the last slide that it might be coming up, so I'll ask it if it um, is not answered. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, great. Thank you so much. Please do um, just, yeah, since I'm not watching the chat super carefully, please do flag me down if there's something in the chat I'm missing. Yeah, feel free. Put, put the questions in there anytime. Thanks, all. All right, so here's the model. The model that we're going to look at is, you'll see structurally looks kind of similar to the ones that I've shown you so far. We are going to introduce, as I said, both a uh, persuadable zealot option. So we have some zealot agents that don't change their opinions. We have persuadable nodes that do. Um, and so we need to define the right-hand side of those persuadable agent uh, differential equations. How do they interact? And you'll see the structure is quite similar uh, to what we saw before, but we're going to instead, I'll highlight here with my cursor, um, we're going to encode both the interaction, the interaction like weights and the dynamics of from, or the structure of the graph into this, this function W, this weight function W. And so what's it gonna look like? It looks something like what you see here on the right. So W, is if we pick, uh, it, it's parameterized by gamma and delta. So gamma decides how steep this uh, logistic function is. So if we pick zero, then um, I think it's pretty clear to see that we just recover repeated averaging, all the nodes are weighted the same. And as we increase gamma, we approach a uh, heavy side function. In fact, we, we converge point-wise to, uh, to a heavy side function. And then delta determines where uh, this this drop will occur. So delta is related to our, our confidence bound. Now we're using here in squared distance instead of um, like absolute value, but but the idea is the same. And then on the right, you'll see this is the interactions of the right hand side. So what happens? How much do each of these agents pull on each other? If they're within um, within delta of each other here, then they will increase their pull at each other uh, like like further ones that are still within delta will, will affect each other more, right? They will change their derivatives more. And then um, beyond that, the, the drop-off is much steeper. So these, I think for folks who do mathematical biology, these are not surprising. Like these are functions like we use and study a lot. These are types of models we, we, we like to study. And um, as I mentioned, we liked this formulation of the model because it recovers these two special cases of very well-studied models. Um, and so we're interested in, in what sense precisely do the dynamics recover these two models and what happens in between? Oh, which is, I, I guess I had a slide for that, but now there you go. So this is sort of the, the setup, what I'm gonna um, discuss for the, for the rest of the talk here. And I'm going to start by just giving some kind of basic results uh, about this model. So if we want to study stationary states and we want to understand something about their stability, um, you want to make sure that you have stationary states. So the first thing that I will, I will tell you is that, in fact, um, we always, we are guaranteed on any finite graph to have at least one stationary state. Um, this is a pretty straightforward application of standard fixed point theorems. And I want to highlight one in particular that is, um, Kind of a, an important one, which is in the case where gamma equals zero. So we have that repeated averaging, but with zealots. So this is this is in fact exactly our Taylor model. That's this super well studied case, um, and the solution, as we discussed earlier, is going to be this harmonic solution. So what you see here is um, here's a particular graph structure. This is a, a Zachary Karate Club graph. If if people like networks, maybe you've seen this before. Um, we have these uh, dark bordered agents uh, are the are zealots. And then as per the graph structure, we see we have sort of a, a range of opinions. Um, like this is this is a like force balance in, is in a sense on this graph. So that's our harmonic solution. Um, that's an example of like one such stationary state in a special case. So now that we know that we have stationary states, um, as a person who has a lot of my 
my heart and training in dynamical systems. Um, we're very excited to study these and to understand their stability and what kinds of stationary states that we have. And so um, if you've done this kind of work at all before, you've certainly met the Jacobian. This is the way we can study these states, right? We linearize about um, whatever stationary state we have, call it, we'll call it X star, and then we get a Jacobian matrix. So the, the actual Jacobian for this could be quite large and complicated looking. So what I'm going to do is just you don't have to um, so much observe the details, but I'm going to give you a bit of information about the structure. Um, first thing to notice that's that's quite important is we we have a block structure for our Jacobian, uh, and so uh, this JP here that's the Jacobian terms of persuadable nodes, the effects of persuadable nodes on other persuadable nodes, and we also have on these sort of off-diagonal blocks the effects of persuadable nodes on zealots and zealots on persuadable nodes. And then on the lower right, we have just the impacts of zealots on each other. Now we know the zealots, they don't change in time. So we actually have zeros down here on the impacts for zealots. Um, so this is quite nice because what this actually tells us is that we, uh, we understand everything we need to know about the spectrum of the full Jacobian by looking at the spectrum just of the, this uh, sub matrix, J sub P. Um, because then what we have is this, the spectrum of our full Jacobian is the same as the spectrum of J sub P plus um, the zeros that, that correspond to these elements. Um, now I haven't shown you actually the structure of J sub P. It's not so nice if I were to write out the whole equation, but I'm just gonna point out um, that there is some like actually nice structure we can work with here. So even though it looks a little nasty if you're taking all the derivatives and everything, what you can see is that this J sub P persuadable um, matrix sub Jacobian is similar to a symmetric matrix, which in fact gives us the facts that are at the, at the bottom of the, of the uh, slide here, right? We have real eigenvalues um, and the matrix that we're similar to has this um, structure, which I've kind of hidden some stuff in here, but the important thing to note is uh, we get something that looks like the graph Laplacian of the persuadable subgraph. So the graph Laplacian has some really nice properties. And then a diagonal matrix, which, okay, in, in, it holds some, some nasty terms in there, but, but we know it's diagonal, so that's, that's a nice thing we can work with. All right, so basically what we're going to do a lot is uh, if we want to understand anything about uh, stability or marginal stability, then we are going to be studying this persuadable sub Jacobian JCP. Um, but often this actually means that we can just study this more nicely structured M sub P since these matrices are similar. And sorry, Heather, when you say that it's similar, do you mean there's a similarity transformation or exactly. it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, so okay. for those of us that have, um, have taken linear algebra, remember some of our linear algebra, um, when two matrices are similar, when there's a similarity transformation, um, there are certain properties that they share and we're, we're leveraging that. Yeah, thank you for that, that clarification. Okay, so we've got our Jacobian. Um, it's a little nasty, but we've got some nice structure in it. And so from here, we're ready to start diving into those questions that I, that I presented. Um, so what I want to do, oh, wait, first I forgot, I want to, um, show you this result, which was the first thing that you might want to do is to say, well, maybe I can just like get some good conditions on stability or instability um, just from what I have. And we can, although, so we, get, we have a sufficient condition here, which actually, if you think about it for, or look at it for like a few moments, you'll realize is not a particularly strong result, but it actually turns out to be a useful one for, for some of the things that I want to say later. Um, so essentially, the idea here is that we can find a sufficient condition for instability if we have uh, this, this equation that you see here, um, or this, this uh, inequality that you see here um, satisfied. So what, uh, the way that you could show this, you could see the little proof idea down here. Um, it's essentially using our facts from the similarity transformation with the symmetric matrix and the Rayleigh-Ritz theorem, which is this nice way to bound our eigenvalues. 
Now, the way that we've done this is we said, well, we can certainly bound the eigenvalues of this uh, symmetric matrix M sub P by looking at E is just our, um, like our, like our standard basis vector, for example, we can use that to pick off the diagonal elements of M. And so as long as we require the diagonal elements of M to be positive, that will, uh, that'll be a sort of sufficient bound. Now, this is an extremely heavy handed condition. <laughs> so um, this is why I say it's a, it's a sufficient condition. Um, it's, not, it's not so clear that this is very, very tight. Um, in fact, I think it's not for what we actually need, but you know, we can make a little bit of progress, but it's, the structure still feels a little bit impenetrable at this stage if you're just trying to do it um, straightforward. But we, we, we can say at least a little bit about uh, situations where we will see instability. Okay, and, and from that actually, this is quite helpful in helping us talk about the limiting behavior. So we know that if gamma is zero, we exactly reproduce that Taylor model. And um, we might like to say, well, if we have gamma very, very small, so we're quite close to zero, do we still get behavior that's pretty similar to, or in some sense, qualitatively like the Taylor model as well? That's what you might expect. Um, and then what we can prove is that, in fact, this is true. Uh, if we're in a, a neighborhood of gamma equals zero, then we actually have that unique equilibrium from gamma equals zero, the one we looked at earlier, um, varies continuously in gamma for a small neighborhood, right? For our small values of gamma. So what that means, um, if you're not so keen on following along with the, the technical details of the theorem, what you take away from this is that if our, our cutoff, our receptiveness cutoff is very gradual, right? If it's, if it's very um, not steep, then we're gonna expect to see something that looks sort of like the Taylor model. And in fact, what you see in this uh, lower left here is as we vary gamma, we have uh, plotted the stationary opinion states for this particular graph at gamma equals zero, and then for various gammas in this range. And then you'll see how each uh, node's opinion sort of is, it's a slightly different stationary state, but we have a, uh, this thing that varies continuously until at some point um, our matrix becomes singular and then, um, then this theorem breaks down. If you wanna peek under the hood, this is basically just a, a, a fairly straightforward um, application of the, the, the implicit function theorem. So that's the idea here. So we can say in some sense that if our gamma is really small, we're gonna be looking at something that's basically just averaging. Um, and if it's gamma equals zero, that's, that's our repeated averaging exactly. So what about on the other side where our gamma is really large? So what I told you is, is in the limit as gamma goes to infinity, the right-hand side converges pointwise to the heavy side function, which gives us our bounded confidence model. Um, what we can show here, and I, okay, so I put the actual theorem on the slide, but I haven't really told you what any of this notation means. So um, I fully don't expect you to understand the notation. The idea here is essentially that what happens is when our gamma gets really, really large, so our cutoff gets really, really steep, then what's going to happen is that uh, in some sense, we are converging to equilibria of the bounded confidence model. And what do I mean by that? You can see, um, if you want to dig into some of the notate, notation a little bit more, if we think about the fixed points of the dynamics for a particular gamma in our smooth model, and then we think about x infinity being the fixed points of the Hegselman Krauss classical model, then the accumulation points for our x gamma are, um, in fact, included in a subset of these. Um, these uh, Hegselman Krauss solutions. So uh, we, in fact, think that the theorem is a little bit stronger than this, but we don't have the proof for a little bit stronger than this. So for now, it, it remains to say uh, that it's a subset. But our, our numerical experiments suggest that, in fact, um, 
these accumulation points are exactly only the x infinity points, but unfortunately we haven't shown that, so I, I don't show you that today. But this is this is quite cool actually because um, this means that if your gamma is large enough, if your if your cutoff is steep enough, then your smooth model is going to have stationary states that look like the hegselman krauss model, which is really great in terms of both analysis and in terms of potentially numerics as well. So if we have like a nice smooth right hand side that we know is going to have a similar type of dynamics, that might be something that's much easier to study um, than these sharp cutoffs that the bounded confidence model has. So we're, we're excited to see something like this. Um, but then, of course, if you know that your small gamma is going to be looking like repeated averaging and your large gamma is going to be looking like Henselman Krauss, then the big question is, well, what happens in between? Like, what is this transition between these two? Um, and I will tell you, this is something that we we understand a little bit, but we are still we are still very much we can't answer this whole this whole question yet. Um, I wish we could, but we we do have some interesting results in in some special cases. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the remaining of my time. And um, before I do that, I do want to convince you that maybe talking about special cases and what I mean by special cases here is going to be special graph topologies. Um, I want to convince you that this is actually like a little bit broader than just these special topologies explicitly. So the idea is that um, we do have a theorem that says if we've got a connected graph like the schematic I've got down below, and we can partition our node sets in particular ways. So uh, let's let's see an example here. So if we have um, a node set that contains no zealots, so that's like S2 here. And then we have a different node set that contains um, only one edge to that node set with no zealots. So we have only one connection between the no zealots one and this, this other character that has connections to zealots. Then in stationarity, what's going to happen is that our, um, our S2 here will exactly have all of these will have the same stationary state. These will come to consensus and it'll be the consensus of this node here. So that means we can actually like kind of build some more complicated graphs by, uh, with the subgraphs that we understand. Um, so now this is still is still in a particular way, but it's um, it's a nice kind of way to think about that this is maybe a little bit more general than just the specific graph topologies. And then if we have a situation over here like S3, where um, this, this S3 subgraph is isolated by the two zealots, um, hopefully it's clear to see that this would evolve independently from S1 and S2, right? It's, it's, um, it's cut off dynamically from them. So you could like piece together um, graphs that are quite simple and make graphs that are more complicated. That's the, the sort of take home message here. So what I'm going to talk about for the remaining time is, in fact, two special topologies that we understand some things about. And um, the first is perhaps the simplest, well, or maybe the second simplest graph topology that if you like want to study a graph, what's the simplest one you can write down? Maybe we can look at a path graph where we where we put a zealot on each end. That was one of the examples I had in the subgraph. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is we could we could so we can then um, say a lot more actually about stability and instability. And we want to start with that harmonic solution to so the harmonic state, the one we have when gamma equals zero. Um, and for this particular topology, we actually have a necessary and sufficient condition for instability, um, which is given by the expression, the inequality that you see on the, on the slide. Um, and the reason that we can do this in this case is because we have a nice matrix structure. For our for our path graph, so that's basically the idea: is can we um, can we get topologies where we can use matrix structures where we know something nice about them? And in this case, MP is tridiagonal and tuplets, so we actually know the the eigenvalues explicitly. Uh, really beautiful stuff. Um, so we can actually then say that was just 
the harmonic solution. So I could say a little bit more um, about other types of stable stationary states that we have for the path graph. Um, and what we can show is that we actually have uh, two additional, one we know um, we have conditions for, two additional one dimensional families of stationary states. So let me explain. Um, I know these are a, a bit overwhelming when we first see them. So let me explain what these figures show. So I'm going to uh, divide these types of stationary states into two families one that I'm going to call polarization like states and one that are, um, we're gonna call consensus-like states. And so these are parameter, they're one, one parameter families of stationary states. And so the idea is that you, you fix one, then you fix the others. Um, so polarization-like means that the stationary states live somewhere in between uh, what you see on the one-to-one -one line, that's our harmonic solution. And it lives in between here and along the dashed line. So all these nodes are something that's, further away, it's closer, I should say, to um, polarization than to the harmonic solution. Um, so we have states like this, right? It's gonna look a little more polarized. And then we have ones that are closer to consensus than, than the harmonic solution. So we have both of those types of states that occur for, um, for different values of gamma and delta. And what you see in the colorful pictures below is the number of stable fixed points that we have in each family. So the number of polarization-like states that we have for a particular gamma on the horizontal axis and for a particular delta. So um, you can see, for example, if you look down in this black region here, that means that if gamma is really large and delta is really small, we expect to see uh, no stable fixed points in that family um, and similar for consensus like this is unfortunately not a complete characterization because we are able to numerically actually find other stationary states that don't seem to fit well um, into these categories so here's an example but we do at least have um, have this like good understanding of of the places where we see polarization like or consensus like states in these in these path graphs so now I want to talk to you about one other, perhaps more broad and more interesting type of graph topology than the path graphs, which uh, we call balanced exposure. And so the idea here, balanced exposure is all about whether or not the persuadable nodes are connected to zealots or not. So a graph we would say has balanced exposure if every node is connected either to both zealots or to neither. So if you think about this in the sense of like, maybe media outlets, right? You're either listening to, um, to both extreme sides or you're listening to none at all. Um, so the left is an example of a balanced exposure graph because these two nodes listen to both zealots, these here listen to none. Um, the right is not because we have nodes that listen to just one zealot. Okay, and so with this balanced exposure case, we can actually say, um, this is the case where we can start to say some really nice things about the relationships between interesting graph structures and the um, stability of states, consensus or, or polarization type states. Um, so first of all, the theorem that you see on this slide is essentially the analogous theorem that I showed you for the path graph case. So we have um, information about linear stability of a consensus state here. And the interesting thing is for a balanced exposure graph, we expect that this, this uh, zero, or maybe to relate to Jonathan's question from earlier, this like moderate state is a stationary state for any gamma and it's stable if and only if this, uh, this expression, this inequality is satisfied. Um, so we can already say a lot more about balanced exposure topologies than we can about a completely generic graph topology. Um, and because of the structure, um, if we get a little bit, if we, we go to what we sometimes jokingly call a special, special graph topology, if we think about balanced exposure graphs that are deregular, meaning all of, the, all of the nodes have the same degree, they have the same number of connections, then we could actually unlock a lot about the structure because we have some really nice, we have this uh, graph Laplacian structure, 
and um, and we can exploit this this deregular fact that means we could pretty much immediately explicitly get um, the result that I'm showing on the slide here, which says that the space of unstable directions um, around consensus. So when we break instability or, or sorry, no, just in, in general, actually, not just consensus, it's spanned by the eigenvectors of the graph of Blossium. Um, and we can say something about those eigenvalues as well. So if this is stuff that you don't think about a lot, I know it's it's kind of jargony, so let me give you the take home message. The idea is the, the direction to which any type of consensus solution to stabilize is aligned with the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian, which is this, this uh, matrix that is related to the adjacency matrix, related to the structure of the network, um, and has some really nice properties. And the other interesting thing about the graph Laplacian is that the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian correlate with community or cluster structure in graphs. In fact, this is one of the kind of old school uh, simple uh, community detection techniques would be to look at your eigenvector associated with your largest eigenvalue of the graph and or sorry, your second largest, your Fiedler eigenvector, and the ones with positive signs could be one cluster and with negative signs could be the other. So there's actually like community detection algorithms based on the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. So we have uh, what we think is, is sort of a nice connection here. And then I'll finish off by showing you um, some nice like face planes and pictures of this. So I will show you two examples and um, to hopefully motivate why we think this result is kind of interesting. So the first is that let's suppose that we have a situation where we have a stationary state where we have two opinions. So we have a, a polarized state, but they are aligned with uh, communities. So here's the structure. This is our special, special graph topology, balanced exposure. So they're, both, they're all listening to both zealots and we have a uh, equal number of edges for each of these. What we've done is we have a really like densely connected subgraph on the left and on the right. And each of these densely connected subgraphs has uh, nodes with only one opinion. So if you look at such a state, we could ask, um, what are the number of stable fixed points with this kind of structure for particular gamma and delta? And so those, those types of uh, fixed points, they're going to fall on the line x1 equals negative x2, something like this, because of our symmetries. And so what you see here is for different gamma and delta, how many stable fixed points of this type that we have. Um, and so you can see regions where we have, we have situations where we have up to five. Um, and what I show here for C, D, and E, these are different phase planes associated with these different regions in this bifurcation diagram. So C is um, for this particular gamma and delta. And then you can see like in these regions where we have, for example, four, like in D, you can see the phase planes for this. So all of our interesting sort of stationary states that we have here, stable and unstable. So we could actually like really kind of unravel this structure for this particular types of stationary states um, and, and where they occur and how many occur. So what are the, let me just point out what the four are. The four of these are here. One, two, three, four. Those are our four stable stationary states from this region here. Okay, so then the reason that you you might be like, well, this is like a nice dynamical systems exercise, I guess, but why, what does this tell us about structure and stability if we want to come back to the original problem of, of opinion dynamics. And I think where this is interesting is to contrast it with the other types of stationary states that we, that we can have. So here's an example, exact same graph structure, but you can construct a stationary state where we now have uh, mixed opinions in both subgraphs. And then we can do the same thing. And what we could say here is that the number, if you look at the number of stable stationary states um, that you can get that have this type of structure as opposed to this type of structure, so we might say misaligned with the communities, 
uh, there are there are fewer of those for the parameter choices of gamma and delta that we have right for any any gamma and delta we choose there's fewer stable stationary states of this type than there are of this type so we have in fact big regions where we have four or even five such states so what we might read into that is that um, this is starting to get at what I think is like a really interesting um, direction, which is to say, we think that we could construe this as saying that it is easier to attain stationary states when your opinions are aligned with your community structure of your graph than when they are not. Now, if you take a step back from like all of this you know, kind of math framework. I think if you asked anyone off the street, they would say like, this is what they would say, right? They would say like, oh, of course, it's easier for people to end up in, um, in ideology groups that are all the same when everybody they talk to, when they're really densely connected to everybody with that ideology, um, as opposed to like having them sort of mix with their, with their, relationships to the interaction structures. Uh, but the nice thing about this model is this actually gives us a more mathematical, like rigorous way to show this, which um, in the bounded confidence model has, has proved to be quite elusive. So we're quite excited about this and we're really excited to like probe it a little bit more as well. Um, but I think that will be about where I, oh, I have, an, I have another slide here, I'm showing you, Sorry, I was flipping back and forth between them, but I could have just shown you them on the same slide. My apologies. Here's the nice compare and contrast of those, those two bifurcation diagrams to see that we have more stable fixed points in this aligned uh, type of stationary state than the misaligned ones. So more, more aligned stationary states than misaligned ones. Um, so there's of course a lot more to do here, uh, but this has been like a, a really fun way to dig into the, the mathematics of these systems and to really understand kind of the structure of these of these types of, of models. So um, what have we done? We have a nice model that is uh, tunable by two parameters, gamma and delta, but this parameter gamma in particular uh, gives us a way to kind of recover classically studied opinion dynamics models um, and then has this whole interesting area of dynamics in between, which we're still probing we've we've done so in a couple of special graph topologies um and it seems like there's some really promising uh directions here that might allow us to understand more about the interaction between stability of states and uh community structure and so we're pretty excited about it it's been a, a really nice project oh i'm just here i want to highlight um i have a lot of other stuff going on mostly these days in the opinion dynamics realm is where I'm the most active. Um, but I do want to highlight that I'm uh, co-leading a workshop group this summer with uh, my colleague Lisette Depillis uh, for Women in Math Biology. So we're going to be looking at some uh, dosing regimen models and hormonal contraception. So that'll be, I think, a, a fun math biology project. I want to highlight for, unfortunately, this year's applications for the Women in Math Biology workshop is already closed. But for um, perhaps for like students or or postdocs, younger folks who are listening. Um, there's these women in math biology workshops happen pretty often. I highly recommend them super fun. So I want to I want to just uh, point out that as like a really nice um, opportunity for for junior people. And with that, I'm going to stop to keep us on time. Um, thank you so much for being here at this your odd time for listening today. Um, big thanks to my my junior collaborators too. So to Phil, as I said, postdoc now uh, going to be a faculty member at Middlebury, and then um, my senior thesis student Solomon, who has accepted a, a PhD position at Northwestern. So uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing lots more from both of them as well. So thank you all. I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks very much, Heather. For the for the interesting talk, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. I see there's at least one hand raised. Guess you have a question. Yes, thank you for this great talk. Um, I was wondering 
this um, result about the communities, mm -hmm. does it depend on the function that you pick for how opinions spread and whether it's mm -hmm. the same function for all the nodes? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. So what we have done so far is specifically for um, this, okay, I'm gonna do some quick uh, <laughs> warning. I'm gonna do some quick, quick movement of the slides for a minute. It is specifically for this uh, particular weighting function on the right-hand side. Um, I think it's a really interesting question that you ask uh, to say, well, we might think that there, there, there may be a broader class of models for which this is true. Um, I, in fact, I, I think there's, there's very good reasons to think that because of the structure of the Jacobian, um, but we have not done that. We've been focusing specifically on this model. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can I ask another question? Please, yeah. Um, do you think in the future you would include the, the effect of say age structure or um, class in your models? Oh, oh my, that's a great, this is a great math biology question. <laughs> no age structured models, right? I have not, I have not done that. Um, I, I actually, as you're gonna say, I haven't thought, I don't think anyone has asked me that before. This is a new one. I haven't thought about um, how one might incorporate age structure. Um, I think that there's, I definitely think there's a lot of interesting work around just to be a little bit broader around heterogeneity in general in these networks, right? We are assuming here that every agent has um, the same right-hand sides with the same parameter values, right? So this is, this is quite a homogeneous population. Um, and so I think it'd be really interesting to look at heterogeneities. There's a couple of folks who have done this in some of the classical models for sure. I haven't done any of that, but I think it's, it's a great question. As far as age structure specifically, I haven't thought about that at all. <laughs> Super interesting. Maybe you can think about it. I also, I had a question about this uh, balanced exposure assumption. Mm -hmm. It was a little unclear to me um, whether the results depended on the, the specific numbers that were chosen for the zealots. Ah, uh, because um, yeah, I mean, in the, in this example where the zealots are minus one and one, mm -hmm. is it the case that they? I mean, they exactly kind of cancel each other out, and it's, it's as if there was no zealot at all. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So we are we are using a we are using some symmetry here. So like these phase planes that we have, um, you can see that they're using the two symmetric zealots, like in this sort of special special case. Um, so there we do assume that. Um, I think that you can relax some parts of this though. And like some of these balance exposure things will still hold. Um, the negative one and one specifically don't matter so much, but the, the, the symmetry that we have does affect some of these later results. So yeah, this is a, this is a good question. Were there any other questions? I, um, yeah, I have, a, I mean, I, I would have a few, but I mean, the one I would like to have your opinion on is um, let's say you have a graph of opinion like that, but at some point you need to make an election. And so instead of having this deterministic system, you, uh, you set up a stochastic system, a stochastic voter system where, uh, where you don't see whether somebody is, you know, 60% towards uh, one and 40% towards, you know, 0 0.6, let's say. Mm -hmm. Just know if they are voting one or minus one. Sure. So 
do you think you would get the same type of dynamics with that or would it be less uh, would you have as many equilibria as you find here or i mean what would you think about that i guess where and i'm still unraveling your question is what the are, are you suggesting that maybe we have like the outputs are discrete like we can only have one and negative one so this is like a different right model, so the right? x would be exactly the same except that where they interact they do not interact through xi minus xj or a function of xi minus xj mm -hmm. but a function of xi minus a function of xj like let's say a heavy side of xi minus a heavy side of xj so you just know if they've took one decision or another one right 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 i see so you're imagining there's almost um it's not like a discrete model like it's there they don't have discrete opinions but the output is discrete right so, so like let me take a very simple example you can you can buy a red t-shirt and a blue t-shirt you know and you like both you know you're 60 percent towards the red you buy the red mm -hmm. and you never wear purple you know and then you only see what people wear that's right yeah ah interesting um okay so i haven't thought about this before now but i can tell you what my intuition is is i my intuition is that the stationary states would be different i think that this would be um a a, a substantial change dynamically um, I think it would be a really interesting thing to study, actually, but I, I haven't thought about it. No, that's cool. I know there are um, there are a couple of models. I can't remember the author's name right now, but there are um, a series of papers from some authors who look at, I think they call them CODA models, which is continuous opinions, discrete actions. Oh, okay. So the structure, I think, of what they study is different than it's it's not like totally parallel to what I study here. But I think if you're interested in that kind of thing, I would definitely look up that um, those those coda models because they they do think about that. Mm -hmm. And so another question that I had, it's in line with the heterogeneity question and related to guest question, but more specifically uh, related to the symmetry of the graph. So I'm wondering if you, if you make the graph asymmetric, hmm. uh, this can change every everything, right? It's really, this is, I mean, and, and the, you know, so I have this question and I, then I have a question about the centrality of the zealots, you know, when in your, in your system, you know, I'm wondering where you place the zealot in the network will have a very strong importance on the output. Is that correct or? Yes, yes. Yeah. So I think these two questions that you're asking is sort of like, these are why these models are so hard to study, but also so interesting to study, I think. Um, the first question, I will say this is part of the, um, let's say part of our inspiration for studying these balanced exposure graphs is that we actually can relax like for um not for this not for this community structure one yet unfortunately but like for this theorem for example we actually could um we could move these zealots around a lot and the structure down here the ones that are not connected to zealots um can be arbitrary so there is actually some flexibility in here we don't yet have flexibility in here, unfortunately, um, for the versions of this work that we have right now. And yeah, similarly, like, does it matter where you put the zealots in your path graph? Like, yes, it, it right, all these things sort of matter and, and can affect things. So it's quite, it's quite a daunting prospect to try to do this problem in complete generality. Mm -hmm. That's not a very satisfying answer, but it is an No, answer. no, it's satisfying. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think the question is really statistically, you know, if you decide that you you place your your zealots uniformly in the graph or 
you know, relative to each other or on nodes that have maximal, I mean, you may think of, you know, probabilistic ways and then maybe you can have probabilistic results with, you know, probability distributions of number of equilibria. Yeah, yeah, I like this idea. It's interesting. Oh, that was really interesting. And yeah, yeah no, thank very you. I look, really appreciate your comments. This is giving me lots to think about. Very, um, very good questions from this this group. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. So let's uh, let's thank Heather again. Um, thanks again for the wonderful talk. And I know you have to run off to class pretty soon, so we won't we won't hold you for much longer. But uh, yeah, looking forward to to hearing about how this goes. For sure. Thank you. I yeah, I appreciate uh, y'all listening. Appreciate letting me talk about. As I said, this is kind of like, I guess, hot off the press. This isn't the right word. It's like. You know, it's not even on the press. <laughs> this is still, this is very like kind of no, that's great, yeah. I'm thinking about. Yeah, my, my so my thesis student Solomon, part of this is what he has written his senior thesis on. So he did um he did versions of a lot of this stuff for like complete graphs. So that which was kind of like a nice place for us to start thinking about these, yeah. these results. So um yeah, it's been it's been a fun thing to be thinking about. I hope that I'll get to see you all, you know, in person one of these days. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. looking forward to seeing you at some conference. If not this summer, then then sometime soon. That's right. Yeah, I think um, I'm not gonna 100% promise, but I think 